Thank you. Okay. Hello again, everyone. So uh, we are gonna move. Uh, we're going to move forward to something uh, uh, a little different. So Colin has been telling us a lot about uh, our uh, trauma patient, about patients uh, bleeding out, and these patients, we need to stop the bleeding. Um, my job in the next, uh, like, 40 minutes to an hour, I thought, what we're going to do, we're going to discuss the deep pathophysiology of bleeding. Okay, and what does my body do in order to prevent that from happening? What can we do to prevent that from happening? And uh, what is the physiological responses to uh, vascular insult? So we're gonna, first of all, we're gonna start it nice and easy uh, by describe the normal physiological process of uh, hemostasis. Then we're gonna describe, don't worry, in basic terms, the coagulation cascade. This has gave me PTSD of when I was going through it at uni and we actually had to know every single bit of it. And uh, no, 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 we are gonna go, we're gonna strip it right down to a couple of basic concepts and that's it. And uh, finally, we're gonna describe and discuss uh, how paramedic intervention, so things that we've got, the drugs that we can give, it can have a direct effect on hemostasis on the, and the coagulation cascade. Now, we've been using this term a lot, hemostasis. What is that? Huh? Absolutely. So if, uh, you know, like we did before, like I, I always like to think that the, the usually the explanation is in the word itself, isn't it? And uh, we've proved that before. So in here, it's not difference, right? Uh, hemo, so from heme, meaning blood, right? Always from uh, um, ancient Greek. And stasis, meaning to halt, to stop, okay? So literally means to stop blood, okay? So the official, definition of hemostasis is the normal response to injury by forming a clot that serves to limit hemorrhage, okay? And this is what happens naturally, physiologically to our body. Now, since we're talking about blood, let's uh, try to remember what is inside blood. So this test tube here represent a sample of blood that has been centrifuged and uh, hence has been separated in all its different components. The largest component of blood, the very top, is plasma. Yeah? And plasma is about 98 point something percent water. But not only water, there is still a little 2%, which also includes different proteins, nutrients, and hormones. That's where they are in a plasma. This middle bit here is uh, the uncoagulated bits of blood, which when centrifuged, they're a little heavier than water itself, but not as dense as your red blood cells. So it's called the buffy coat of blood. What it contains is white blood cells and platelets. Now, this is a bit of a hazardous statement because if I tell you that the Buffy coat and it contains only white blood cells and platelets, I would be lying to you. Let's say in vast majority it does, but there is quite a lot of other elements in there that will contribute to your natural hemostasis. And we're gonna talk about them throughout uh, this lecture. So at different points, I will say, and this is also free flowing in blood. And you're like, yeah, Dan, you didn't mention it at the beginning. No, you're right. I'm about giving you a fair warning now. Okay, so there's other stuff. And obviously the red bit, what's in red, what are the red bits? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they're red blood cells, you know, it's kind of a, a good old a familiar friends are red blood cells. So this is the moment really, um, let's keep in mind. So not only platelets, white blood cells and stuff in circulation in your bloodstream. I'm going to start throwing some names at you that it will become familiar later on. So we've got things like fibrinogen. Have you heard of it? Yeah, fibrinogen is uh, 
and uh, is present in our normal circulation. Um, another chap that we're going to be familiar with, von Willebrand Factor. Heard of that one? No? It's, uh, we're going to learn a lot more uh, about this one. Uh, prothrombin is in there, plasminogen. All of this stuff is all just flowing in, uh, in your bloodstream naturally. What are they for, though? So we talked about blood. Next step, let's talk about the blood vessel. Okay, so that is the natural, natural follow-up here. So this is a cross-section of uh, a, uh, a blood vessel. The middle bit, obviously, the lumen of your blood vessels, that's where your blood flows through, okay? The bit that your blood, let's say, touches is the endothelium or the tunica intima, okay? Your endothelium, composed by all different endothelial cells, that have a huge um, impact in maintaining your hemostasis and maintaining a balance in uh, your bloodstream. After that, in your tunica media, we've got all your smooth muscles that we call around all blood vessels, which are going to be involved in case of vasoconstrictions, vasospasms, vasodilations, and all the rest. Those are the ones that will be involved. And then in your tunica adventitia, just on the outside, that's where we'll have fibroblasts, which are quite structural proteins as such, and very important, we will have some uh, collagen as well, which is, again, a protein that is that you find everywhere in your body that needs shape that needs structure. It's a little bit like a scaffolding uh, type of protein. Now, this is going to be quite important as well and what we're going to talk about. Now, this picture represents, uh, shows collagen only outside in the tunica adventitia, but it's not just there. You will find strands of collagen like in here as well, just underneath your endothelium and in between your tunica intima and your tunica media, you will find some collagen here, and you will find some in here as well. Always, again, to maintain the structure of the blood vessels that otherwise would just end up collapsing on, on itself. With me so far? Excellent. So, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about the normal blood physiology. So, while circulating in your bloodstream, Blood doesn't clot, does it, as such, well, unless it really needs to. Why not? So, this is, firstly, if your blood was just to spontaneously clot, which it does sometimes, if we have uh, sort of a, due to medical conditions or abnormalities uh, within your blood, what can that cause? Huh? DBTs is one. Anything else? MIs. Anything else? PEs. You know, all sorts of strokes. All those, all sorts of things. Okay. So if blood, the maintaining the the fluidity of blood is an essential element of a normal physiology, and normally blood in a healthy individual should not clot spontaneously while uh, flowing in your bloodstream. This is due to a huge number of factors. You literally, you could have a whole speciality of medicine about that, okay? So what we're gonna do um, now, we are going to explore a few of them, a few of these. So we're gonna talk about a few elements that maintain my blood unclotted while, uh, uh, while I maintain a, a healthy physiology, but they're not, what we're going to talk about is not an exclusive list, okay? There's much more as well that's going to be involved in it. So, first of all, we, um, we're going to talk about what uh, impact your um, endothelial cells will have. So, your endothelial cells secrete nitric oxide and prostacycline, okay? Um, I want you to imagine those as almost a lubricant inside your blood vessels. So your platelets will come brush it, will come past them, but they just don't bind because of this combination of nitric oxide and prostacycline that almost imagine if they like push them away from the side of your blood vessels and stop them from adhering 
to the side of the blood vessels. So in a way, like think of as the lubricant of your blood vessels going through. Okay, so this is nitric oxide and prostacyclin. They also act as vasodilators. And the reason why that is important is because we've got a lot of vasoconstrictors flu freely flowing in our bloodstream at the same time. So what's going to happen? Here is just a matter of balance. Because we have a constant secretion of nitric oxide and prostacyclin, amongst many others, and we also have quite a constant flow of vasoconstricting element in our bloodstream, it keeps the balance, keeps the balance as it is. And then when needed, there's going to be more of one or the other, which then cause, I cause my blood vessel to uh, remain dilated or constrict. So both these elements are continuously expressed. So they're just a continuous expression of this in order to maintain my normal physiology. Now, there is something else that uh, we produce that uh, whose name we might be familiar with, and that is physiological heparin. So heparin is something that we do produce uh, normally. What it does is gonna make a lot more sense uh, later on, but it does bind to antithrombin, which it attaches, which is, oh God, here we go, which essentially binds on to certain clotting factors and makes them inactive, okay? There is some clotting factors in there, but because antithrombin is there, it's just gonna inactivate them, okay? And that's what uh, heparin is gonna help in doing. Thrombomodulin as well, it activates protein C, which is gonna make a lot more sense of what it is towards the end of the presentation, and also is heavily implicated in maintaining anti this anticoagulated state that our blood should be in, in a healthy individual. So all of these four things that we talked about, so we talked nitric oxide, prostacyclin or prostaglandin 12, physiological heparin and thrombomodulin, there are things that are quite useful to keep in mind um, on what keeps your blood uncoagulated while flowing. So we said is a matter of balance. So all of this gets naturally produced in your bloodstream. Platelets are kept at bay. Your coagulating factors are kept inactivated and everything is fine. But what happens when this balance is disrupted? So what happens when I actually get an injury and my blood vessels get an insult and something starts happening? Well. That's when hemosta hemostasis kicks in. So what is my body going to do in order to prevent me from dying? First of all, the first stage of hemostasis is vascular spasm. First thing is going to do my blood vessels that are going to go into spasm. And that is the first line of defense of my body to prevent exsanguination. Okay, so that's why patients in shock can trauma patients as such often. They might not present bleeding as much as we thought they might do because of that. This could be one of the reasons for it. But we need to be careful about that. We'll explain that why in a minute. The next thing that is going to happen, platelets will form a plug where the hole is, or at least they will try their very best to do that. Then the coagulation cascade happens, and we're going to go into details-ish uh, of it on what happens during it. And the combination of the two will then form a stable blood clot that should provide uh, with hemostasis. Now, what is a blood clot? We're talking about these clots. What, what, what is it? Any thoughts? What's a blood clot? Give me a best shot. <laughs> plasma binds to the blood cells. Plasma not really, no. But there is some binding there involved, yeah? What is it that usually that you think about that it binds or clumps up together in a blood clot? Hmm? 
Platelets, absolutely. So platelets are gonna be the first ones, aren't they? They're gonna start clumping together. But a little plug of platelets, is that a blood clot? Is that it? Is that a big bunch of platelets, is that it? What do you think? It's not. So platelet aggregation is not sufficient to form a stable clot. What it needs is a mesh of fibrin on top of them that keeps them all together and stabilize it, okay? So a blood clot, it is indeed a plug of platelets stabilized by fibrin, okay? By insoluble fibrin. And that what will give you a stable blood clot. So all of that needs to happen. Hi. Once that has happened though, this is to form a clot, which is great. What will need afterwards, physiologically as well? What happens when, once I'm done with it? A clot permanent? They're not, are they? Because otherwise we just have clots all over the place. So eventually I'll need a negative feedback loop that sort of destroys that clot in order to return to our normal physiology. And that's what we call fibrinolysis, okay? And this is the last stage of hemostasis. The first three, well, the first one really is in order to facilitate my platelet aggregation. The middle ones, they will form a stable clot. And then fibrinolysis at the very end, what it does, it gets rid of the clot when my blood vessels is healed. When I no longer need it, I need to safely dispose of it. You can't just get something that kicks the clot away and goes, that's it, go in circulation, because as we know, can cause MIs, strokes, PEs, DVTs, etc., etc. So, let's start from the beginning. Vascular spasm. So once my blood vessels get injured, there is quite... Um, a number of uh, subcellular processes that happened that then will cause my blood vessel to uh, spasm. One of these uh, things is uh, endothelin, okay? And that is released directly by your endothelial cells when they are injured and does cause uh, vasoconstriction in itself. Something else that causes vascular spasm is a nervous reflex, yeah? So when you get hurt as such, your nervous system will react to this and cause a vascular spasm. Now, this is very important at this point to point, point the difference between vascular spasm and vasoconstriction. What do you think is the difference between your blood vessel going into spasm and your blood vessels undergoing a chemical vasoconstriction. Biochemical vasoconstriction. Any thoughts? What would be the difference between the two? So, yes. When we've got my vasoconstriction is a narrowing of my blood vessel, and as long as the um, biochemical environment is the right one, it will maintain that particular diameter. What about spasm though? Is that a permanent thing? Can I keep my blood vessels in spasm for a while? For a while, yes. for a while yeah, but... But it will ease off. That is, that, is the, that, that is the difference, okay? So a spasm is something that will ease off. And I'm glad that you brought up that example about the traumatic amputation. You're quite right. So we put the tourniquet yes or no. And well, it's not actively bleeding right, right now. Is a big vascular spasm to be blamed for this? But that, there's a risk of that easing off as such. So as vascular spasm is something that will eventually ease off, okay? And that's what your nervous system will do. We also have um, inflammatory mediators that will uh, stimulate uh, vascular spasm by doing what? By stimulating your nociceptors. What's a nociceptor? What does it do? What does it make you feel? Pain, absolutely. That's, these are the inflammatory mediators that make you feel pain. Now, this um, 
I'm, this hopefully is not going to raise any confusion later on. So what it does is stimulates pain, and that's when it goes back to your nervous system, and that will cause a spasm. Because we know, as for classes that we had before, that a lot of inflammatory mediators actually produce what to your blood vessels? Often it makes them dilate. Yeah, it makes them quite dilated and leaky. And that's why you cause redness, edema, and all the rest. Okay, so but you have these inflammatory mediators that are stimulating your nociceptors, while right? you feel pain, and this causes some of this vascular spasm. And this is the first stage of hemostasis. Okay, first line of attack for your body to go. I shall not exsanguinate today. Okay, I will tighten my blood vessels and make sure that my blood is not going to all run out. The second bit is a little bit more complex. Okay, so we've got a platelet plug formation. Now, imagine through your blood vessels, so you've got your blood vessels and your blood flowing through it. Vast majority of your blood will flow through like the axial bit of your blood flow, so of your uh, blood vessel, so towards the middle. And your platelets, which are these little rounded fragments of a much bigger protein, right? They tend to flow on the peripheries of your blood vessels. I want you to imagine them as almost like uh, the guardians of your uh, epithelial cells, of your endothelial cells. Okay, they just go right at the top of your blood vessels and they look at all the endothelial cells, go, yeah, that one's fine, that one's fine, that's all right, and I keep going. Okay, so that's where your platelets usually, um, usually are. The process is very complex and very dynamic, and there's a lot of research is still ongoing on what exactly happens. But what we know of it, we'll try to describe it. So this is what we're talking about. So this is a big red blood cell. This is a white blood cell. And that's the guy that we're talking about. Okay? So the platelets, quite these small fragments of, uh, of proteins, just flying around, and then they will start forming a plug. How? How are they going to do that? So obviously, when I get vascular injury, my platelets will start to get exposed to elements that have not been exposed to before during a free-flowing of blood. One of them being collagen. You remember we talked about collagen just a few slides ago? Yeah? So collagen is, is a little structural protein just on the inside of your blood vessel that has got absolutely nothing to do with being within my blood vessel on the inside. And that act as a trigger. That and this other factor called the von Willebrand factor. Okay? It'll be up there, no worries. Collagen and von Willebrand factor, they just bind together and they act almost as an emergency beacon to all the platelets that are floating at that point, which are on the peripheries of my blood vessels. So There's gonna be loads coming through. So I've got my collagen, bound to my von Willebrand factor, and whenever platelets come through, they bind to it. And that's how you start getting loads of platelets getting attached to wherever my collagen is exposed. Which means that is where the actual insult, the actual injury of my blood vessel is, because this is the only area where collagen will be. And that's how I start getting all my platelets together, where collagen is. Once they bind to this combination of collagen and Willebrand factor, platelets, they activate. So right now, as they go normally in your bloodstream, they are in their inactive form, in their inactive state. So as soon as they bind to this uh, um, von Willebrand factor collagen complex, they activate. So what does an activated platelet do. And that's fascinating what it does. Because the first thing it does, it goes through a conformational change. It starts changing shape. And from this little lovely round particle that you've got, it starts growing 
It, they're called philipodia, but they, they look like tentacles, okay? If you want, we can call them the tentacles of the platelets. Well, I prefer philipodia, but whatever. And they start growing. Why would they think, why do you think they would do that? Why do they need to change shape and start growing arms all over the place? Huh? Absolutely easier to catch. You need to spread their surface area as much as possible. Okay, so that's the first thing that they're gonna do. The activated form of your platelet, that's the first thing it does. It will go through a conformational change, develop philipodia all over the place in order to stretch out. But that's not the only thing they will do. They'll do another couple of things. The second thing they will do, they will activate on their surface. See, at this in this analogy, I'm the platelet and I'm activating my surface here. My, uh, to make some fib fibrinogen receptors on their membrane. A few minutes ago, I told you fibrinogen, it's free flowing in the bloodstream. Yeah, it's there, it's always there. At this point though, the activated platelet uh, activates this um, receptors that calls for fibrinogen. It goes, by the way, come and give us a hand. Okay, now all the fibrinogen that is flowing past will bind to this activated um, platelets. And this will act as a bridge to more platelets to attach. And that's uh, all the platelets that will attach each other thanks to this fibrinogen bridge. But that's not it. That's not it. The another thing that my platelets will do will start secreting granules, okay? Um, they are divided usually in what we call the, uh, the alpha granules and the dense granules, but I don't worry too much about that. And what do they do? So the, the first, so basically inside they've got a couple of sacs, and that these sacs, they break and they release all these substances just in the area of, uh, of the injury. In one of these sacs, we've got more von Willebrand factor and more fibrinogen. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because so more platelets attached there, more von Willebrand factor is out, which binds to more collagen, which we'll call more platelets, you know, and more fibrinogen is out, which will bind to their own receptors to attract more platelets. And the other thing that it will secrete is things like ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, which helps with uh, the vasoconstriction, but not only activates more platelets all around. So more platelets come and they activate them. It's go, oh, okay, I'm activated now, I suppose. Well, I suppose I'll bind uh, to that fibrinogen down there and create my philopodia and start secreting my own chemicals as well. On top of that, they release calcium, which is gonna be a, an enhancer for so many things, so we'll cover later on. And their cytoplasm will also release Thrombaxane, thrombaxane A, and you will see what it's, how it's spelled. And what this does, it just calls more platelets to the area. So you can see like this is beautiful mechanism that it just, as soon as one is activated, more get called, and then it produces their own substances to bind to each other and to create this plug that will keep on grow and getting bigger and bigger and attract everything to the area. Okay, and that's what, on top of that, I think serotonin is also, is also produced in that case with act as a vasoconstrictor as well. And this is what happens to my um, activated platelets, okay? So my von Willebrand factor, will find, that's found in plasma, will bind to my collagen, and then all of that will start getting initiated. And this is just a very quick summary of what I just said. Obviously, guys, don't worry, but I know it's a, it's a, it's a complex um, system as such. Um, I try to strip it down to the absolute bare minimum, but realistically, if, uh, if you're worried for your exam, if you can explain me just basically, this, I'll be happy, okay? Any extra will be good. But I definitely, definitely recommend reading into it. It's fascinating. It's a great, great thing. So 
And that was just how to form a platelet plug. So what do I have at this point? At this point, I've got loads of platelets, which now look like little octopi all over the place, over the hole that has caused in my blood vessel, which are calling more platelets, and they're binding to my more fibrinogen, and that's all I've got so far, okay? So I need something else to help me stabilize this clot. Because we said my clot is not just a plug of platelets. I need something else, a stronger mesh on top of it to keep it nice and stable. And that's when the coagulation cascade kicks in. The coagulation cascade is, <sighs> as I said, I remember studying it at uni on LV elements of it, and I still get nightmares about it. Okay, it's uh, it's complex, it's complicated, it's got all sorts of uh, pre-coagulant factors, things that get activated, deactivated, things that turn into other things. But really, what we want to get at the very end of it is this: we will produce thrombin. That you need to know. Okay, that is the final result of my coagulation cascade. I get produced the production of thrombin. And thrombin, what it does, it converts soluble fibrinogen. Where did I say fibrinogen is? Say that? Absolutely, it's free flowing, okay? So it's free flowing all over the place. But what is fibrinogen is essentially an inactivated form of fibrin. And what are we gonna need fibrin for? Huh? What did we say we need fibrin for? Where is it going to be needed? Huh? Absolutely. We will need fibrin in our clot. We need a mesh of fibrin on top of our platelets in order to create an actual stable clot. Right? And that is what essentially is going to happen. We'll produce thrombin, and thrombin will convert soluble, when we say soluble, it means it is flowing in your bloodstream, fibrinogen into fibrin where it's needed. So, that is your clotting cascade. And this is actually a relatively easy version of it as well. This is actually a simplified version as well, uh, because there's actually quite a few things that impact on that. And this has got only the factors, the important factors in it, and doesn't have all the different enzymes that uh, act on all of those. Let's not worry about the whole thing. It's big, it's scary, it's... Let's break it down, okay? Because it's actually quite a palatable uh, thing. So, my coagulation cascade comes in three main um, pathways. The first one is your intrinsic pathway. If something is intrinsic, what does that mean? Where does that originate? Inside. From inside, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was listening. <laughs> absolutely. Your intrinsic pathway originates in the inside, okay? Your, then you've got your extrinsic pathway, which is then kicked off by a stimulus from where? From the outside, absolutely, from the trauma, from the injury as such. And then we've got the common pathway, which is essentially is going to be the big conclusion of my coagulation cascade. So, in this, we decided to add some sort of a self-help slide here. So that we're during your revision, don't worry about it, it's fine, okay? So let's break it out into little bits. Let's start with this bit on, the, on its left. So the intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway essentially is, um, describes how factor 12, which is up here, which again is present normally in your blood plasma, triggers the conversion of other clotting factors over here until you would get to factor 10 and it stimulates the production of thrombin, okay? So the intrinsic pathway, what it does is starts from factors within your blood, uh, within your blood plasma to then stimulate the production of thrombin. That's it. The extrinsic, the extrinsic pathway, what does that do? 
This one, it gets activated when there is an actual damage, so there is trauma, and there's a release of this tissue factor, okay? This tissue factor will be released in your bloodstream or your blood will be in contact with this tissue factor, not normally, it would, that would only happen when there is an injury as such. And then stuff happens and we produce thrombin. That's all you need to know, okay? So really, if you break it down quite easily, intrinsic pathway, stuff happens, produces thrombin. Extrinsic pathway, stuff happens, produces thrombin. Happy with that? Yeah? That's palatable, isn't it? Excellent. Now, the awesome bit is the common pathway, which everything comes down to what? It's the conversion of prothrombin, which is also flowing in your bloodstream, by the way, all of it, but is an inactivated form of thrombin. So what we do, Thrombin then converts soluble fibrinogen to fibrin in order to stabilize the clot, okay? And that's what your common pathway is, okay? This is the final bit. So really, essentially, all comes down to this. Prothrombin gets turned into thrombin, and the role of thrombin, this you really need to know this bit, eh? That thrombin is the one that converts soluble fibrinogen, which is free-flowing in your bloodstream, into, into insoluble fibrin that will help stabilizing my clot. That's it. Now, I can't clot forever. If I just keep on clotting, then I will end up being a big walking clot and I'm not gonna walk for long at that point obviously because if I've got too many clots obviously then you will die. So there is mediators of this that make sure that I clot just the right amount. So as far as all of that happens, so while all of this is happens, while all my prothrombin is turning into thrombin and while all this thrombin is converting my fibrinogen into fibrin, there is just um, almost um, behind the scenes We've got elements like protein C and protein S that they sort of uh, inhibit all of that. And they go, okay, you're gonna convert that to fibrin, but not too much, okay? Which are, you wanna convert that into thrombin, but not too much, okay? We'll just do it just right. Otherwise, it would be at the cascade, we'll end up in just an, an, enormous, an enormous thrombus, okay? Which will be very much contraproductive. Protein C, what does that do? What, what does that do? It degrades several clotting factors, slowing the, whole, the overall rate of the process. And we are happy with that. Antithrombin is uh, a protease inhibitor, how we call. And what it does, uh, it basically attacks thrombin directly from stopping it to doing its job, which is to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And all of this just happens at the same time, just to sort of regulate the speed of my clotting. Uh, your antithrombin is activated, for example, by heparins. Does that make sense now why we would give heparin to patients? Yeah, because in that case, if a patient is having troubles with clotting, what do I do? I just disrupt that balance, right? By adding a little bit more heparins to it, and I've got a lot of that thrombin that is gonna get disrupted, and it stops the formation of the plug, okay? So it doesn't destroy the plug. Let's keep in mind, this is important. So the heparins, they do not destroy the plug in itself, but what does it do? It just prevents the formation of others. Yeah, by activating, by really deactivating thrombin and stopping the production of fibrin. From fibrinogen. Uh, just a couple of slides here in case on, uh, just for your own interest, uh, while you're revising about deficiency of uh, protein C and what consequences it would have. And also here, uh, if you're interested, just look into like hemophilia and the different types of it, and which factors, deficiency in which factors causes different types of hemophilia, which we thought this makes sense once you have seen the clotting cascade and what the different factors are and what they mean. But that's just for your own uh, interest 
uh, while uh, revising, if you want. So my coagulation cascade, my coagulation cascade two pathways, in string, intrinsic or extrinsic. Both of these pathways, they involve clotting factors from both plasma and extravascularly to eventually form thrombin. Some clotting factors also affect other parts of hemostasis, such as platelet aggregation, and eventually we get to fibrinolysis, which is my last step. Now, at this point, it's worth keeping in mind, because we are talking about trauma after all, all of this happens uh, at the same time. So I've got my platelet aggregation, I've got my clotting cascade is happening, trying to form a clot. Now, you will have some, uh, you will probably seen some lectures, podcasts, uh, webinars, whatever, when, whenever we talk about trauma, the concept of how the first clot is the best clot. And uh, or one of our roles as clinicians is to maintain that clot. Now, I hope this is going to guide you towards the concept of that's why. Because once I disrupt that clot, what's going to have to happen? Absolutely, everything needs to happen all over again. But at this point, I've got someone significantly sicker, potentially, with a lot less blood, potentially, you know. So whenever I disrupt my first clot, all of this needs to happen all over again, but it's going to be less efficient because my patient is naturally deteriorating. Hence, whenever we talk about protecting the first clot, that's what we mean, okay? Because otherwise, all of this needs to happen all over again, but it's gonna be less efficient the second time around, okay? Now, let's say in this patient actually was, was fine. You get it? We did a very good job at it, and now my blood vessels are starting to heal up. This blood clot now needs to go, right? And that's when we're going to uh, talk about fibrinolysis, which is the last stage of hemostasis, which is essentially, in a circle, brings back my blood to a normal, uh, to my normal physiology. So, basically, all it works, all fibrinolysis is, is proteolytic enzymes. What are proteolytics? The answer is in the word. So proteo, what is that to do with? Proteins, yeah? And to lyse something, what does that mean? What was that? To destroy it, absolutely. To destroy the proteins, right? These enzymes, that's the roles that they've got. To destroy the proteins of fibrin, very specifically, okay? So that's what proteolytic enzymes are, okay? And the activation of this process requires the activation of another chap that is in our normal bloodstream plus minogen, okay, which is the inactivated form of plasmin. You remember fibrinogen was the inactivated form of fibrin. This is essentially its, um, its nemesis, okay? So plasminogen also that coexists with fibrinogen happily in a normal blood flow is the inactivated form of plasmin. Okay, and plasmin, that is what's gonna really start going at it, are your fibrin fibers, okay? And this is mediated by your tissue type plasminogen activator. Does that make sense? Yeah, a plasminogen activator turns my plasminogen into plasmin and plasmin just wants to destroy fibrin, okay? I bet you could write an awesome comic book about this, you know, with some terrible superheroes in it. Okay, so this consumption of fibrin leaves all sorts of residues uh, in your bloodstream, including uh, D-dimers. And this we just added just in case you might have heard uh, patients to go to hospital and get a D-dimer test, okay? Which means that a positive D-dimer test, which means that this is happening a lot. It means that your blood is trying, your, your body is trying to destroy a lot more clots than it's supposed to. So when you've got a positive D-dimer test, it means there is a lot of these residues and there is a problem somewhere. So you're at high risk of DVTs, PEs, MIs, strokes, and all the rest and stuff. And you need further tests for that. So fibrinolysis. So TPA is stored in your vascular endothelium, okay? But that one, 
it doesn't activate straight away. Is a concentration mediated a factor? What does that mean? That it needs to be sufficient amount of it in order to start doing what it does, okay? Which is converting your plasminogen into plasmin and start destroying the fibrin clot. So yes, it's there, it's always there, but it needs to be more and more and more in order to start to activate, okay? We use it in clinical practice as an artificial thrombolytic, and uh, obviously what it does, it binds to plasminogen, causing plasmin to, to form, and then plasmin to degradate the, your, your clot itself. In clinical practice, what is that called? So I do not remember having any amples or vials of tissue type plasminogen activator, or do we? Tenecteplase. Anyone used it before? We have it in all, we have it in all, should have it in all the vehicles, do we? Yeah, we should. Uh, this, uh? Yeah, so we'll have it. You'll have uh, obviously a checklist on when to use it on, and usually you use it when instructed to do so, and that is your um, blood, blood, um, clot busting drug, okay? So that is your difference. So your tenecta plays, so that's what it does. It literally reactivates your fibrinolysis, so it actually bursts the clot. Your heparin, it prevents more clots to forming, to be forming, yeah? And you're going back to my platelets, why not? How about my aspirin? What does aspirin do? Why do we get aspirin? What, what does aspirin do? Say that again? Excellent, absolutely. So it's an anti-platelet effect. So that and my aspirin works even before all of that. You remember we talked about thrombexane A? Yeah, which is one of the one of the substances that my platelets release. And what they do was thrombexane A does, it calls more platelets to the rescue and it goes, please come and help me out. We need more and more and more. What aspirin does, it stops that call sign. Okay? It said, ah, no, 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 shh, you don't need more platelets. Ah, but I do. No, 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 you don't, you don't. Right? And that's what aspirin does, okay? So my aspirin stops more platelets to come to the injured area if necessary. My heparin right, will stop more clots to forming, and it's going to be my tenecteplase that is actually going to burst the clot by inducing further fibrinolysis. Um, and obviously, the one we use, though, is a lot more effective and straight to the point. It doesn't go inside all the endothelial cell and start dicking around, waiting for enough uh, amount of it uh, to be there, and then eventually decides to activate. No, we've got a very activated form that just goes and does straight to the joint. Uh, also, we talk about another drug that we use that is still acts within your fibrinolysis and is your antifibrinolytics, which uh, unfortunately I already gave it away, but is your tranexamic acid, okay? So TXA, we give TXA to a lot of our trauma patients. Uh, main recommendations are to give it as soon as we can. Um, GR Calc says give it over 10 minutes, slowly, slowly, one meal at a time, while en route, if you have time, kind of things. Again, yes. Not only the trauma team, I mean, pretty much anyone in hospital, yeah, everybody gives it. We are overly cautious by a potential sudden drop in blood pressure of our patient. Now, the papers behind it are interesting. The results questionable on the methodology of it, considering that it's quite a lot of research done in other parts of the world which really have proven that TXA is actually are quite a safe uh, drug. But the consensus uh, from GRCalc is being that for us, our line of practice would be to give it nice and easy to avoid that potentially a sudden drop in the blood pressure of our patients. But indeed, uh, other clinicians from the trauma team, critical care paramedics, uh, doctors, and yeah, most of others that will attend there, they will just arrive and they shove it in straight away and such. Here, when it comes, 
your thinking paramedic versus paramedic by numbers, yeah? Read your papers, make your research, make an informed decision. Whatever you do, we are not telling you what to do or what not to do, we have definitely no place to do so. That's where you go, can you justify your actions when you've done X, Y, Z? Now, obviously, I saw a doctor doing it, therefore I've done it. Not a good reason in front of an HCPC board, okay? But if you come out with decent research and uh, decent findings for it, and this is why I've done it, that is much better. Make sense? Yeah? So I'll leave it to you. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do. So tronexamic acid, what does it do though? So we give it. So either they give it fast, we give it slow, we give it immediately, we give it on the ambulance and all the rest. It doesn't matter, but we give it. A lot of our trauma patients, they get a TXA. What does it do? So that's what I want to know. Before I put something in someone's veins, I want to know how does it work. So TXA is an analog of lysine. What does that mean? Which essentially is an artificial version of lysine, okay? And this amino acid binds to plasminogen and prevents the activation of plasmin. So what did we say plasmin do? What was that? It breaks down the clots. What it does, it attacks fibrin, okay? That is fibrin's arch enemy, which is plasmin, okay? And that's what's gonna start trying to break down the clot, okay? But with TXA, what does it do? It prevents the formation of plasmin. And what it does though, it binds to your circula circulatory, easy for me to say, uh, plasminogen, right? And it goes, you know what? You shall not activate plasmin today, okay? And that's what it does. It just sits on top of plasminogen and goes, uh-uh, you're not turning into plasmin. No, no, not happening, okay? And that's what it does, it prevents my natural fibrinolysis, the natural breakdown of the clot that would naturally occur from happening. That's what TXA does. It doesn't stop me from bleeding and doesn't make my, my clot stronger. It stops it from breaking down, okay? So these last two slides is just a quick, really a reminder of things, okay? Don't let them confuse you though. So as part of your normal physiology of trauma, your inflammatory response, of course, will have a deep impact on it because it will happen. Whenever I'm hurt, whenever something happens, whenever I'm in pain or there is foreign um, bodies of any sort, or any antigens entering my body, my inflammatory response will kick in. Okay, because it's one of my very first lines uh, of defense. But this is more like a systemic response. Okay, something that will happen to my whole body. So we talked about, especially when we talked about asthma and other respiratory conditions and such, we talked about your mast cells, for example, yeah? Your mast cells, they start seeing all these things from the outside that are not supposed to be in the inside. They bind to it and de degranulate, right? And they start releasing your um, inflammatory mediators, including your histamines, your bradykinins, uh, your leukotrienes, and so on and so forth, okay? So that is still happens. What it does happen at the same time, it helps the healing of the area, okay? Now that's why we really need to be careful or not to make confusion. The area surrounding the injury will look what? What do you think it will look like? Red, swollen, sore, okay? And those are the three main things. It will look red, why? Because locally, right, my blood vessels, my peripheral blood vessels start dilating to try to get actually more blood to the area to try to fix it, even if I'm still exsanguinating, even if I'm still bleeding out. The leakage, why do we start leaking? Why do we start getting swollen up? For two reasons. One, because my peripheral blood vasodilation, actually, what happened was start getting some of the plasma to leak out and create swelling. But also, my inflammatory mediators, they're very good at recognizing injured cells. The ones that go, oh, hold on a minute, that, that's not quite right. They don't try to heal them, they kill them off. That's what it does, okay? So they just break down all the injured cells and all the inside all the cytoplasm from the inside, these injured cells, obviously just leaks out, creating further edema. Other thing that my mast cells would do and all my inflammatory mediators will do, will also stimulate my nociceptors and make me feel what? 
Pain, absolutely. And pain really is a way to, for myself to defend myself, to go, ouch, this is so, that is not good, okay? Which again, it's balanced out by then my sympathetic nervous system, which then is gonna go, no, hold on, but are you in pain? You know, and it's gonna protect you for a little while until all my adrenaline, noradrenaline wears off, and then you're in a lot of pain and bleeding out and all the rest, okay? So this is just a quick, Summary, just as a reminder that because I'm injured, my inflammatory response doesn't mean that it doesn't have a, a, a saying in all this. It still does its thing, you know, but more systemically and a lot slower. Okay? So, quick summary. Hemostasis is a process of preventing and stopping bleeding. This is as done in a number of ways, which is your blood vessel contraction, coagulation, and formation of a stable clot, which we said is your... Um, platelets and a stable fibrin mesh over them. And the coagulation cascade involves in a combination and recombination of clotting factors, which eventually lead to the production of thrombin, which then convert your fibrinogen into fibrin and gives you your clot that you so much want, okay? Fibrinolysis is my negative feedback loop process that is just gonna help me then getting rid of this clot safely instead of just sending it off in circulation. Uh, causing all sorts of uh, all sorts of problems by uh, obviously converting my plasminogen into plasmin and then attacking fibrin and inflammatory response as we said as what will cause swelling pain at the site of injury all this works brilliantly together in order to uh, stop the bleed repair my body and then send him off back once healed but obviously a major trauma patient, all this will try its best to work, but it might not be sufficient. And that's why paramedic intervention, so the first people I'd seen, so obviously the ones that will act within the golden hour, but I would argue that is a platinum five to 10 minutes at the very beginning of it, where all of this is, tries to happen, and it does need a little input from ourselves, whether pharmacologically or by extrinsically applying tourniquets, bandages, and all the rest, in order for this to happen. And that is it. Any questions?